Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. On the show today, Katie Dimmock. So Katie um, is a dancer, director of the dance the dance group, dance movement therapist, and she's been teaching body mind centering in the UK since 1997. So Katie, welcome. Yeah, good morning, Mark. <laughs> good morning. It's relatively early, isn't it? We've, we've had a difficult time getting hold of each other, but we've managed it. Um, where are you today, Katie? I'm at home in Manchester, um, where I practice um, at home in my private practice. But where I also run um, Touchdown Dance Company in the in Waterside in Sale, and have all kinds of projects in uh, in schools, sort of working with body mind centering and um, contact improvisation mix within the sort of therapeutic context. Okay, so that gives us our sort of main topics for today. Um, yeah. How did you how did you get into this? What's what was your journey with the body? Um, well, I was always interested in performance. I mean, having danced ballet from the age of three and thrown that away at the age of 16 I was kind of looked for something else and uh, the thing I jumped into actually was writing next I became a poet and a playwright for a bit and then I kind of found my way back into theatre um, through working uh, at the Half Moon Theatre it's called it was called the Joan Littlewood Theatre in London whilst I was a student and um, I became literary manager there Anyway, the longer the short of it is that I then discovered Dario Fo and Frank Arami at Riverside Studios and all kinds of physical theatre. So I made my way into um, physical theatre rather than writing theatre. And that initiated an interest in the body. So uh, Monica Pagna, who was uh, teaching at Lecoq School I went to in Paris, um, used to teach us Feldenkrais work. And this was back in the early 80s. And... Uh, that was just amazing for me. I loved the fact that all this body exploration and mapping of the body and expressive movement um, was enriching my being as I was performing. And uh, and it kind of went on from there <laughs> to all kinds of laboratory theatre with Cardiff Laboratory Theatre Company and then um, getting into voice and body and then teaching voice and body and the buffoon work and stuff. And everything to do with physical expression and the fact that we have so many states of tension in the body and so many states of consciousness in the body kind of unfolded into me discovering body-mind centering in the early 90s. It was in 1992 I was invited to scribe for the Connected Body Conference in Amsterdam, which was a, a, a conference with Eva Schmale and Jacques Van Eyden and somebody else. And, um, and I was... I did the body mind centering workshop with Jacques Van Eyden and he gave that week of intensive BMC training to launch the European okay. program, which uh, I just fell in love with it. And I decided that um, I would then do the program, the body mind centering program in Europe. So you, then, you went to train in BMC in Europe or? Yeah, in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, I did the school of body mind centering training, but I had to wait 18 months. And in that time I did Linda Hartley's program in the UK for a bit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so Linda's filler. one of the sort of better known people in the UK for that work, isn't she? I think uh -huh. yourself and Linda are probably the sort of two most known names associated with, with BMC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we, we did a module together. We ran the nervous system module in 2004 as the first one I, I did in the UK. But till then, I was obviously teaching it in the dance context mm -hmm. and doing uh, applying it to my work in health. So I became more and more um, attracted to working through Touchdown Dance, having started Touchdown Dance in 94, then the Body Mind Century and went straight into the Touchdown Dance. It's interesting that some dance schools seem to involve a lot of, you know, Feldenkrais and somatics and uh, uh, BMC, you know, I've got friends um, at the place in London and they tell yeah. me about classes they do. And then others have never even heard of it. You know, I've yeah. got other people I know who are dancers. They're like, you know, I'm, I'm doing a Feldenkrais course today, actually. And, I, you know, I've mentioned that to some dance friends. They're like, what's that? you know yeah. they've just not heard of it and bmc oh. is an interesting one because um we had beverly nolan on the show just for listeners if they want to kind of get a another piece another person on who wants to chat about it um and a couple of other people who have done work in this area but it, it seems to have quite a hard core of very dedicated followers but still isn't that known outside certain circles i think it's being discovered i mean we don't do this 
international marketing thing. You know, we don't push. We find, People find us. They fall upon us if they're interested. It's always the way. And it tends to be strongly word, by, word of mouth. And I think you'd find the same with things like craniosacral. You know, people aren't necessarily drawn to it, particularly in this day and age when people are strapped for cash and it's not, you know, you can't get grants to do this or you can't get grants for anything these days. But you have to be, you have to be committed to do the training. Quite long modules as well, right, sometimes. Like I've, you know, I've, I've been trying to get to one of yours for about two years and then I just don't have five days blocked out by the time the dates are out. I can never make one. Well, that's exactly what I mean. You have to put the dates in your diary and then commit to it. And we do have some people um, spreading it out over, I think somebody recently graduated who took 10 years to do the programme. And that was wonderful for that person because she it meant that she could be her mom, be the mom or be the worker, be the support in the family, but take her time to graduate. And, and it, every time she did the course, it went straight into her work. And I think that's the embodiment aspect, isn't it, that we work experientially um bmc is an experiential uh, learning process so then you go away and you find that it just seeps out into all areas of your life um, maybe we should say briefly what bmc is uh, <laughs> come across it. um you want to hear okay so body mind centering started in the 70s in the states with bonnie bainbridge cohen and a troop of other practitioners and dancers and movers um who were exploring movement and embodiment and in the exploration they started to find their way into looking at all the different body systems so they call it experiential anatomy so you look at each of the body systems as they're known separately and explore them in the embodied way so you look at bone the skeletal system and you explore the nature of the system so the cellular structures how the bones form embryologically how, what their function is, a physiological function. And in embodying them, we have principles like stability and mobility. So bones stabilize the structure, but they also, because of the joints and the nature of the joints, enable mobility. So we're in, as we're exploring our bones, we're also exploring um, their, their application, well, how to, well, what we call the mind of the system. So we have the body experience, and then we have an understanding of the mind of that system. And um, so the embodiment of body mind centering is um, is really just to find your way into being in your body in a particular system, mm. separating it out, and then we it, integrate it all back into the whole again. So, so as I've done very little bits of it, I've got some friends who are very immersed in it, but it seems like a way of sort of getting to know yourself from the inside out one kind of system at a time so there's that really like okay what is the nature of blood or what is the nature of my liver how is it to really be present in that yeah and um it kind of sounds a bit off the wall really doesn't it say well how do i i mean because if you look in a medical book you'll see blood depicted in a graphic way as as a fluid flowing through vessels and the cells of red blood cells are different to white blood cells. And then you have lots of other stuff floating through the blood, um, different types of, of cells. And then where they come from, where they, where they originate, they don't just emerge in the blood vessels. They're formed in the bone marrow or wherever. So they, they, they give us lots of facts, but we don't actually go away with any understanding other than having to remember what we've read. But if we explore blood as one of the fluid systems of the body and that it comes um, embryologically from the, the bone and then we put our hands on our body on the bone and then we put our hands on our body to the heart and then we explore the flow of the blood at the rhythm of, of, um, of uh, arterial blood is very different to the backflow of the venous blood system. So we're exploring the nature of that system in movement whilst learning about the anatomy. You know, I, I think this relates to, we had a philosopher on called John Vaveke, and he talks about ways of knowing. And I think this is intuitive to anyone in our field, but he's giving it a very academic and rigorous language, which I'm grateful for. And um, there's a confusion in our culture that knowing about something is, is the only way of knowing. And it's cognitive learning, like you read a book and there's this many red blood cells and you know white blood cells and platelets or whatever. But 
actually in many ways more useful is this experiential knowing is this felt tasting ontological kind of knowing um which is um more helpful maybe to embodiment practitioners like i spoke to a fun question on my course yesterday and she said oh do i have to study textbooks of um anatomy and learn all the muscles and i said you know what you could but i'm not sure how much that would help you and i you know mm. she was interested in anatomy i suggested bmc might be more useful for her for her purposes as an actress she was a professional actress who was doing film quests rather than um learning you know doing a anatomy coloring book and learning the names of the four different quadriceps or whatever yeah yeah no well i i would agree with that and i think um what with what we what we find when and in, what is the word embodiment if it's not about going into your body and finding out how it is to exist from the inside and then discovering that we have far more different states of consciousness than the mind, the thinking mind state of being. You know, we drift in and out of states of consciousness through the day. We might go into a dream time state and we might go into a, um, a very calm, restful state. Then we might be really activated and angry. So w- what we discover in body-mind centering is that there are even more states of consciousness or states of being when we go into all the different body systems such as the, the nervous system, the state of being in rest and recuperating and digesting our food, is goes into a very quiet kind of state. And yet if we go into the cerebral spinal fluid rhythm, we go into this very ethereal kind of state. Mm-hmm. And that is very healing to go through those states yeah. and to give the mind a rest and the visual stimulation a rest is really healing, but it's also very enriching. And people go away feeling that they've discovered so much about themselves that, and 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 I, even this sense of knowing is about knowing about me, who I am. So it's it's really reaffirming right. identity. Right, this is deeply my blood or whatever is deeply part of me. Yeah. So I can see how that brings us back to ourself in a different way. And uh, I think this intuitively yeah. makes sense. Like I, I. I go to different yoga teachers and one yoga teacher, Gary Carter talks about fascia a lot and Pete yeah. Blackaby is all about the bones because he's an osteopath and most yeah. yoga teachers, it's the muscles yeah. and John Sturk is the skin, which is quite unusual. And oh. what I noticed going to all these different yoga classes is I'd come out feeling quite different. Yeah. Now they're all sort of quite gentle classes I go to. They're all sort of Scaravelli ish. The techniques oh. are different, yeah. but they're not, you know, it's a lot of hot yoga different, you know? Oh. And but I was like, oh, I feel different because I've been really orientating to my bones. Mm. Or when I'm in the gym, I'm orientating to my muscles and I, I come out feeling like powerful in a different way because I've been orientating to that muscular system for the last hour. So yeah. I, I think this yeah. sort of does intuitively make sense to people, even though it also sounds, let's be honest, a bit weird in some ways. Well, it's weird because when we've, we've not been brought up to think about our bodies in this way. You know that we we hand our bodies over to the medical profession. Yeah. When we go to the medical profession, they tell us that we have to do cardiovascular exercise to be well. Yeah. And then you go and you got you got mental distress. And in all the years I've dealt with mental distress, when I've gone into secure units and stuff like that in hospitals, and I've done BMC based work with gym, with small balls and a lot of touch based work. Well, self touch, not not uh, interpersonal touch so much. <laughs> It's been really, really effective. Yeah, because it's it, it's a, it's, a, it's a holistic idea of well being. Yeah, and at whatever level you you go into a room, whether it's with children in a school or blind adolescents or whoever it is, you know how to relate to them and you know how to bring them into movement. And with the developmental work which you mentioned earlier, you can have a process. You've got a process, a developmental process that you can hinge everything into or or eke everything into or base everything into, which gives a, a, um, which gives a kind of a container for the process. Yeah. Yeah. The developmental piece seems to be the other big piece in BMC, right? As as far as I can tell from various books and teachers, I know that there's the body systems and then looking at how we move as infants and how, how that develops. I've been studying that a bit in Feldenkrais recently as well. And, quite fascinating these different stages and you feel quite different moving in a crawl or radiating or the different stages that exist yeah well in, in body mind centering is separated them out into 
the um, stages of well from embryology into fetal development and then and the development of the senses is integrated into that and so that when you're born the development of the being is not just about movement it's all about the response of the being in the environment in which one is so the sensory stimulation the stimulation of gravity so if i if i'm planted in a chair too soon i'm not going to develop my my well my my mobility and my motility uh-huh. because i've been sat up vertically too quickly and so then the developmental work when we when we do that with people with no matter what age we find that by taking people back around to lying that they start to fill in any gap and that in itself has a real impact on the mind on the on you know because it's all integrative if we are planted in a chair too quickly we miss stages of development that would nurture our way of relating through our hearing because it's all about seeing the world mm-hmm. uh, smell and taste. so you know it, it's it's um it's, it's not just about the movement pattern it's about the whole dimension of the movement mm-hmm. that, that makes sense that makes sense so the more we roll around we're on the horizontal plane and as we start to come up to the vertical we come into the vertical plane and as we start to travel through play, space we're on the sagittal plane. And if we have missed the vertical plane because we've been planted in the seat too too quickly, we've missed a whole realm of being. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, is there a risk in some of the BMC work that it can be potentially a bit fanciful? Like, I've seen some really good stuff. Uh, there's people I respect in the work, like Beverly, that, you know, I've had teacher courses I've done. And I've, I've also seen sort of quite a lot of rolling around on the floor and people sort of deep in their imagination rather than necessarily their embodiment. They're um, um, pick, spending a lot of time sort of imagining their liver or whatever. Is, is that uh, a risk with the work? Um, I don't think we imagine the liver. Um, I, I think it's more about a way into the body through what we call somatization, where we do a guided uh, exploration. So we in, invite people onto the floor to roll around and to move and then to get in touch with their breath. And that that is a method that takes time to adjust to because it's it, it's just so um, unfamiliar to people. But if they if they get into a deep state of rest whilst they're doing that, and in other words, they're not really hearing the words anymore, then they they are recuperating. But then as they come out and they come back to partnering and they start to share, then a lot of stuff that has happened and other layers of consciousness starts to come up. They go, oh, yeah, and I felt this, actually. And they start to recognize all kinds of things in that experience that has, has slipped into their awareness because they're talking about it, that they would not have realized, or they just would have woken up and forgotten about it and come back into the world and, and not noticed. So, you know, this whole thing of reflexivity is this thing of, I have an experience, I then come out of that, and I think about it, and I reflect upon it, and what I originally thought has changed and grown into so much more because I've given space for other ideas, other interpretations, other aspects of knowing to to um, come to mind. And so it, it may, I, I mean, I, I hear what you say, but it, that sounds like um, perhaps somebody has dwelt too long in an exploration for it to appear fanciful. Whereas actually, I think sometimes the mind is impatient and wants the information too quickly, uh-huh. rather than allowing the body time to give to, to be in body time and to allow other stuff to come up, other ways of knowing than given being given the information, being told what it is you're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of find myself a little torn in my relationship to. I was very impressed when I met Bonnie, and her touch was something you know outrageously. Uh, sensitive and compelling and there's definitely something in it that I'm super drawn to and I, I'm really trying to articulate something so I don't hear this as an attack in any way I'm really trying to articulate a more intuitive sense of what is it that I don't like about it while simultaneously being very drawn to it and it, it's something about uh, the embryological work I've never really got that but even that aside there's something about it that feels vague or there's a very feminine quality to it, which I, I, I think may just be a learning style. <laughs> I, I tend to like things sort of linear and clear and cognitive. And, and, there you go. I, and, it just, and I don't want to make it wrong or me wrong, right? Because it would be really yeah. easy to turn around and say, well, right. you, you it's, know. It's, 
yeah, it's really not about wrong or right. And I think there's a learning style thing here that may just not be that great a fit for me personally. But I also the reason I keep having teachers from BMC on is because I, you know, I think it's very valuable too. But well, maybe it's the intensity of it that is a bit overwhelming for you. But it's if, not intensity. Like, you, sorry. If it's not intensity, if it's if anything, it's a lack of intensity. Yeah, yeah, but the intensity of the sensory aspect of the learning process. So we sense, feel, move, whereas you want to think, move, sense. You want more of the the doing and the learning through the doing rather Mm -hmm. than allowing yourself to sense and feel what is happening. And I think relation when you actually get into working mode, working with other people, if you can allow yourself to go through that experience, then you'll be much more open to the relationship that you're building with your with the group that you're working with, because you're feeling and sensing and feeling what's happening with them relative to a kind of experience that you've had. And you're reacting and responding in a very organic way to what's going on rather than thinking, well, I'm going to give you this to do now. And then you'll, then you'll, I'll give you that to do. And then you'll get this out of it, which is the sort of linear consequences. If I do this, then I'll have that. And um, it's, 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 we get to, I will have that, but in a much more, um, what we call the horizontal field rather than the grabbing the facts and pulling at them. It's this being able to hold a space in which things can emerge. And then that's the nature of the learning rather than telling people, okay, now you are rolling on the floor and I want you to feel gravity pulling on your body. And then you'll feel your organs falling to the ground. And then you'll, as you come out of the floor, you'll feel the support of your organs. Yeah, but I don't, wouldn't tell people what to feel wherever. I mean, that's not, yeah. that's not my style. I mean, I think it's a sort of bottom up, top down kind of approach and how goal directed something is. You know, these are differences in style of teaching and learning. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I was actually booked in. It took me two years to get the dates booked in for the um, uh, a BMC course in the UK with sort of like 10 long weekends. And I sent off the application form and, so, and I thought I was booked in and I thought I'd be doing it uh, this uh, last weekend and it didn't uh, arrive. Somehow the email didn't arrive or um, oh, I didn't no. <laughs> that yet. after two years of planning and holding these dates for two years. Um, and by that point, they said, look, it's the day before. I tried to message them the day before saying, hey, what's going on? Are you going to send me the joining details? You know, I'm fully expecting. And somehow my secretary thought that I'd booked it and I thought she'd booked it. And uh, now that's gone as a possibility. So I'm now going, okay. So it was a bit weird though, you know, it was like maybe some bit of resistance for me as well. But um, like but I didn't double check. It's absolutely check fine. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that's natural because I went through the first two years being a heck of a lot of resistance, thinking, what the hell am I doing here? What am I getting out of this? And then I decided that I was going to do it for me because I knew I was getting something out of it, which yeah. I, I couldn't grasp. I couldn't grasp. And then right, as I went into the third year, because in those days you had to do four years or nothing, I, I really got it. And the third year was when the body systems material is integrated into the developmental and we can work more in therapeutic context and educational context. But people who were coming, who were professional somatic practitioners, whether they're yoga people, dancers, or people who are just looking for personal development, they may come for two, two courses and then go away and then come back a year or two later. Or some people come and they go, this is it, I'm doing this now. And having thought they'll just do one course, they do the whole thing really quickly. So it is really subjective. You can never never tell what people are doing. My attitude was like, well, worst case scenario, I spend a whole bunch of time feeling into myself deeply, which is not going to be a harm for, you know, someone that does somatic. So that was my sort of attitude was always like, well, you know, at least if nothing else, I'm going to be sort of deeply present to myself for an extended period of time where I won't be on my email. But, well, um, no, I, but I think every every aspect of the embodiment, and we have we have the study manuals and everything like that, there is there are a whole bunch of principles that you should go away with. But the, the learning that we do in the studio, the experiential learning in the studio, is backed up by the study manuals um, that, bon, you know, that Bonnie has written with her other teachers and are being developed all the time. So the study guides have plenty of information in them that you can go away and think about and work with. So it's not like you just rolled around on the floor and experienced yourself. I, I get it. I get it. We have, we have professional <laughs> issues classes. We have group debates and all the rest of it. And we have question time and 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 loads of opportunities to share our discoveries. And I think that's it. You get from it what you what your interest is. Each person brings their interest. And some people come with really direct questions and want direct answers. 
and some people just don't want to have that they just want to be in the room and then go away and let it seep into their life and I think that's the thing is that you you know you'll find after the work because it's embodied that the embodied memory just comes up it just comes up when it's needed like whether you're a psychotherapist working I've got psychoanalytic psychotherapists doing the training in Scotland and they say well it's happened again went straight in next day into session and that's, that's <laughs> fantastic quick interruption to tell you about my book embodiment creatively named hey actually embodiment moving beyond mindfulness you can find this online at the embodiment book Dot com. That's the embodiment book.com. Um, so this book is an introduction to the whole field. If you like these interviews, you'll probably love this book. Um, funny stuff, poems, personal stories from my life, illustrating what embodiment is all about and loads for professionals in the field too. Uh, top teaching tips, language tips, that kind of thing. Yeah, a real condensation of um, everything I've learned about embodiment, basically. Um, so you can get pre-orders at amazon.com and if you just put in embodiment moving beyond my mindfulness that's the name of the book or go to the embodimentbook.com on there you'll see quotes from various teachers a bunch of fun illustrations and you can also get the first chapter completely free online at the embodimentbook.com enjoy and back to the interview Can you give us a little experience of some of the body stuff or is it, I mean, it's obviously online very short or maybe just an example, maybe if that's not possible of some of the, it'd be nice to have a sort of grounding example of some of the body system stuff. Okay. Um, which one do you want to go for? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to you. What do you feel like this morning? <laughs> um, well, there's either the organ system, which is all about the viscera or there's the connective tissue system, which is all about body, bones, muscles, ligaments, fascia. And then there's the nervous system and the skin. So those are the kind of the three divisions that are the embryological uh, uh, kind of... I'll tell you what, let me be selfish. I'm a little tired today because I've been working really hard on my new book. So what would be, um, what would be a pleasant one to go into, bearing that in mind? Right. Well, what, let's, go, let's go organs then. Let's go organs. And with the organs, they're in the cavities of the body. So you have the lungs and the heart and you have your viscera. So choose an organ that is kind of, might be your heart pumping around or it might be a, a hungry belly. And just place your hand on the surface of your body where that organ is. And then start to breathe into that place. And you'll sort of sense a kind of difference in density of that organ perhaps than others. Um, and you, you won't, it's not about knowing what it looks like at this point. It's about sensing and feeling and breathing into your organ space. And then breathe in through your nose and start to make a hiss sound by blowing out through, yeah, through your teeth, your tongue behind your teeth. And then send that hiss sound into that place where your organ is. Which organ are you with right now? Going with stomach. <laughs> And you might feel a kind of vibrational quality around your stomach. And straight away, um, you might come to a kind of more introverted, quieter place. Your mind is maybe questioning what it is that you're doing, but just allowing yourself to sense and feel. So keep the hissing. on the out breath. And a quite a long out exhalation. And, then, and this is the thing that if you find that it's hard to do a long exhalation, try not to let your, your, your out breath just collapse out, but try and prolong the out breath. 
over say eight five seconds or ten seconds or whatever so you're lengthening your out breath <laughs> Can you hiss? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just, just all, all aware that <laughs> but I mean, it probably doesn't make for the best podcast. <laughs> no, that doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, I'm not interested in um, entertaining people. It's more the fact that... Well, I am, because this is a podcast for other yeah, people. Yeah, but this is a process. It's not about entertainment. It's about giving information. And that in itself is one method of going into my body and finding my organs, because there's no way without a map yeah. and an anatomy book that you're going to know where your stomach is. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter at this point that we're in the stomach. No, it doesn't because within two minutes, we're not going to get there. It's more the method of uh -huh. going into my body, uh -huh. and finding the structure through giving a vibrational quality to it. And then we would start other things. So then we would initiate movement from the stomach. Then we would do the jiggling, the hands-on jiggling, which you can't really do to yourself so much. So because you, we're sat okay. here and we're sat in a we're sat up looking at each other. So if you were rolling around on the floor, I would invite you to turn towards your stomach and lie on it and breathe it. So lots of different ways in, but the all okay. each each of the systems will have particular um, kind of affinities with different methods. So the organ system, because it's they're very fluid fats fundamentally, they're just that they all have their physiological function. Yeah. But at least the organs through hissing will it will then impact on your autonomic nervous system. Will then give a sense of um, releasing energy in the gut system, um, which obviously then ties into Chinese medicine and all the rest of it. But you will, you know, you you won't necessarily feel a huge amount in. Well, I did notice a bit of a shift even in that short time. I appreciate this is yeah. You know, I'm asking you to do something borderline unreasonable here that this is this is i did notice a, like a deepening into myself and a, like oh like a tuning into a quality and i just had some breakfast and my you know, belly's kind of happy and it started <laughs> rumbling a bit then i started to feel my pulse under my hand quite strongly yeah and it was like oh, okay and it was like oh this could be something you know when i'm not on a podcast to come back to to tune exactly. into my stomach and exactly. you know, whether i overeat yeah. or eat crap yeah. foods or what my stomach has to tell me and and just tuning into that um well, well that's it that's it that's exactly it. quality i found quite helpful yeah yeah it is about equality and then we'll talk about it now we could talk about it for longer than mm. we spent doing it and that's that's interesting like we try and give people time to having done a partnering or being, mm. or being exploring mm. something like this to then have time to reflect on it but the thing is that i stuck to the hissing because if you don't get the hissing right, then you're not going to get a sense. What does of, the hissing do? Sorry, Katie, I think I missed that part. What, what does the hissing so do? The hissing means that you're you're creating um, like a, 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 a kind of a, you're you're putting into your body a state of um, restricted breathing, which and then the hissing is a vibrational kind of you know if you if you do a sss, then you feel into your um, inside of you, this kind of vibrational quality of the hiss, which then will travel down through your, your internal organs and, and move around a bit. But you can actually start to direct it very specifically to an organ after a while. But this is the practice. So the hissing is one of the methods that we practice to get into our organ system. And there are m others but it's just one that is particularly effective if we're sitting up and trying to get into touch with, with one. No, thank so. you for that. For that. I, you know, again, appreciate it's a brief experience. And I, on the podcast, I kind of sometimes like to have people do a little experience for people, you know, sure. it's an embodiment podcast. But I mean, then once you've done that, you can then initiate movement from your stomach. Yeah. You might lift your rib cage up over the top of it, or you might shake and jiggle into the stomach. And that, again, is releasing the general organ system. And then we might do hands-on specifically on the stomach. Okay, great. That's useful. I think we're a little tight on time. So I'd love to hear about some of the other, some of the groups you yeah. work with. Like you said, you work with um, blind people. Is that right? Um, well, I work generally in the community and I, I um, 
the visually impaired work is through Touch Down Dance because that was set up by Steve Paxton and Anne Kilcoyne at Dartington in the so 80s. That's the, that's the contact improv side of what you do, well, right? Well, think... it's not just contact improv. Contact okay. improv is one of the methods because Steve Paxton said that his ambition was to bring a touch-based art form to touch-based people, such as, which he assumed visually impaired people were. But clearly visually impaired people aren't only through t- don't exist only through touch. They also exist through atmospheric vibrations and energy fields and haptics and all the rest of it. So, but at the time, contact improvisation, people started to, he noticed that sighted people would close their eyes. So he thought, okay, let's try this with visually impaired people. And then that opened up this whole realm of experience, embodied experience, doing contact improv with blind people. It was not taught in the same way. You can't teach it in the same way as you do with sighted people. And it just really turned, um, well, the, the whole debate on touch deprivation and touch, whether you're blind or sighted, people found that it just opened up all kinds of taboo areas, like the stigma of being blind and excluded from society. So my embodiment practice and my, my work in community settings is all about giving people who are normally excluded from the arts or from creativity or from embodied experience the possibility of doing that. So I work with autistic children I work with the the infant developmental work with children with babies with newborns and then I work with any age group we've got BBC children in need project working with three different schools which a school for blind children is one a school for complex needs is one and a, and a school for learning disabled children is another so that's one and then we do work and projects as we um maybe tour as a dance company we'll do projects where we go so we've been out to Sri Lanka doing a peace and reconciliation project and the body mind centering has been key to that embodiment has been key to that and the idea of therapeutic holding of children who've experienced trauma and in a group of children whose parents were killing each other you know so we 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 work this work will go across all kind of settings so you're using contact, touch work, BMC. I mean, what are those, some of the modalities you find useful in those, those kind of settings? I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. it just is- Yeah, the developmental work is really significant. Yeah. Um, the the touchdown dance work, which is very close to BMC, obviously they, they, they were of the same people. So Lisa Nelson well, of, of the contact world also worked with Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. And so, you know, so did Nancy Stark Smith and the book Sensing Feeling Action came out. So, BMC and contact have always been very closely related. But the back-to-back work, the touch face work, the touch relational work, being in contact with one other person and using your centre of gravity and theirs to create movement that you can't possibly do on your own is opening up a whole realm of experience, of embodied experience, which is repatterning and healing as well as just energising and feeling good. So that, that's why it's successful. It doesn't matter where you work with it. So I think it's the it's the holistic nature, and the very it's humanistic. It is you know <laughs> if you want to talk about the psychotherapeutic aspect of it, it that it's if you put a framework around it which is safe and contained, then you've got psychotherapy going on, and then you obviously you need your clinical supervision and all the rest of it going on. But if you work with it in an educational context, then you're working alongside um, any other educational. Uh, setting to enrich people's sense of themselves and their confidence and all the rest of it so the the goals in those settings are all about personal development self-confidence a physical expression and improving communication and, and all the rest of it yeah, i just put it up touchdowndance.co.uk it looks really nice actually and um recognize one of the contact dancers on there but um yeah, yeah that's uh well wonderful work wonderful work yeah, and there's I think on the Embody Move website there's actually a video of me teaching in Warsaw. And so it's a group. So embodymove.co.uk is yeah. under touchdown dance, it has a separate website. That's the BMC program one. And there is a video on there of teaching um a group of visually impaired and blind people in Warsaw. So there's a bit of Polish spoken on there, but it's uh, it was made by Martin, can't remember his surname, but um it's just a really lovely video and it shows BMC integrated into the touchdown work or underlying the touchdown work. There's a lot of 
So it's embodied-move.co.uk, right? Just so, and as ever, these will be on our, our website. If people look at the podcast website, but if, if people Google Katie Dimmock, those are the websites that come up pretty quick as well. And some some videos on Vimeo I came across as well. Yeah, yeah, the Vimeo stuff um, tends to be on co- back contact improv about touchdown dance with all the in my history of being in all the contact improv um, festivals and stuff I've taught over the years. But you know. The touchdown work is is incredibly important. Okay. I mean, we need to be moving towards close here. Is there anything else that is kind of core to your work or something sort of super interesting for you right now that you, you haven't yet touched upon? Yeah, my uh, one of my core things at the moment is the, the membrane concept, which I'm writing about a lot. And um, I've got a few publications going out now. And I'm talking about touch the use of touch based practices in psychotherapeutic context where there's still a heck of a lot of taboo and um, so the membrane is this um this sense of self-communication and communication with the world through what um i perceive as being um the container around myself so it's, it's a bit difficult to talk about <laughs> in a hurry um but my skin is the one type of membrane My kinosphere is another type of membrane. And then when I'm with others, there's a sense of a group mind and a container around that group mind. Um, And so there's some people talk about the symbiotic relationship between mother and infant and the, the, the kind of the space that that creates around the mother and the infant, which other people such as fathers find it difficult to get into sometimes. Um, but that's just one example. And when I'm working with um, a blind child, then my sense of relating to that child will be very interpersonal to us two. Or whether I'm working with a, a client in psychotherapy, I have this sense of mm-hmm. what's containing us in any move in any moment and how that changes over time. Um, so I'm just very interested in what I'm calling the membrane concept membrane concept okay well interested in that let us know when your book's out i'll uh, give it a plug on the embodiment conference group and facebook and all the rest of it so any so there, are, there, are, there are a couple of out um i got a, a chapter in the book called the rhythms of relating in children's therapies which was edited by colwyn trevathan and stuart daniel and there's a chapter in there called the lost and found and that book is out by jessica kingsley and it's um, produced to, to raise money for children's charities, but it's quite a nice collection of things. And there's a chapter in there about the developmental work. Okay, Katie, thank you. Any closing message about the body for our listeners? <laughs> Inhabit your body and let it reveal you to yourself. <laughs> Hey, thank you. It's nice to start to get to know you a bit and I'm going to be looking at your calendar to see if I can make any of the courses next year. Now I've accidentally cancelled this other one. So. Well, you can, all, you can always visit a couple and see how you feel the, find the room. And it's not about chasing the monkey, as Franklin said to me once. It's about finding your way. If it's of interest, you'll find your way to it. Okay. And that's up in Manchester, yeah? No, it's London, Edinburgh, Snowdonia. Oh, I don't like going to Manchester. That's good. Okay. No, it's not, never in Manchester. It's never not- in Manchester. Oh, that's a huge relief. But I suppose <laughs> I've just hang- I was hanging out with my Mancunian friends a couple of days ago, and they're just mercilessly taking the piss out of me, and I'd forgotten what that was like being up north. <laughs> <laughs> We're not all like that. We're not all like that. They're not all like that. Okay, Katie, this has been fun. Thank you so much for your time. Great, Mark. Thank you. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it. Um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it. Old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's 
less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodiedfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodiedfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on embodiedfacilitator.com website, uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. OK, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.